Assalamu alaikum everybody. This is Baba Ali and welcome to another week of Colorist Islam Club. It's amazing. It's fun. It's Saturday. Yes. I thought, don't you like Saturday? Saturday's like the best day because we're after Friday, right before Sunday, and we can have Colors of Islam Club, which means we get to be together. So uh, as you guys know, last week we had like an amazing show. Like we asked, well, actually we didn't ask. You guys asked questions. Questions that matter, because the questions were important to you. And when they're important to you, that means they're important to me. So for those who missed it last week, we had this new thing called Ask Baba Ali, where you guys get to ask any questions you guys want, and the questions you ask me, I answer them live. It's like, what? And the best part is you're totally anonymous. Anonymous is basically a fancy word for saying nobody knows who you are which means you can ask any questions. Even those questions you're too shy to ask other people, you can ask Baba Ali, because Baba Ali answers them. And he says it in a way that people understand. <laughs> so let's take a look. I was actually taking a sneak peek at some of the questions. And I noticed some of the questions were interlinked with one another, which means that um, they were like uh, very similar. So I thought maybe I can knock out two or three questions at once. Now, some weeks, the question is very, very deep. And uh, they require like the entire class to explain. And sometimes the questions are very simple and I can answer them like two seconds. <sighs> well, not, not, not that fast, but you know, pretty fast. So um, I hope to get to everybody's questions. So if you do ever have a question or if a question just pops in your mind, uh, type it up and uh, no one knows who you are. Okay, so let's get to our little document here. And um, as you can see, question number two is talking about, can you tell us about your journey of Islam? And then somebody else also had asked a very similar question. Uh, uh, they asked about um, uh, at what age did you convert to Islam? And another question was, is your family also Muslim? So a lot of quote unquote Muslim questions and your identity questions. And uh, I'll, so I'll tell you guys my little story about how I became Muslim. All right. So long time ago, Long, long time ago. Sounds like we're talking about Star Wars. We're not. Um, uh, Baba Ali was born into a very unusual situation. You know, most people, when they talk about the conversion of Islam, they talk about the rough, up, uh, rough upbringing. They had a very tough time. Uh, for me, it was not like that. I grew up, uh, I had a rough time in a different way. See, my family um, is... Uh, it was a very wealthy family. We lived in Iran. Um, my, our backyard was so big that my dad used to go hunting and he would be gone for two days and he's still in the property. That's like, that's massive. I remember being a child and having 13 bicycles. And this is before I'm like four years old. I remember having swings in my room and I, we were, I was just on the second floor. Uh, I remember just having like a lake in the backyard and that's what we call the swimming pool. It was, everything was like massively big and we had guards and like the stuff you see in movies. So my parents at a very young age, I started traveling around the world. I, by the age of four, I've already been to London. I've been to here, I've been to here. And we would just travel. And um, I didn't, what's it called? I didn't, uh, as a small child, I didn't really understand what was going on in the world. Um, by the time I got to four years old, we were traveling to Los Angeles. This, this is where I live right now. And my parents were coming here to go on vacation. They didn't speak English. And because they traveled to Paris, they traveled to London, I used to just take me with them. And when they came here, the revolution in Iran happened. And a revolution is when there's two countries that are, well, a rev, sorry, revolution when, when, is when one part of the country decides to take over the other part of the country, which made it very unsafe for us to go back home. So we end up stuck here in America. Uh, not that was a bad thing, but when you don't speak English, you don't have any work, you don't have a home, you were just here on vacation and now you're here forever. <laughs> so have you ever been on vacation somewhere and they're like, hey, well, this is a really nice hotel. Well, you're gonna get stuck here for like ever. And I've, I've never been back home since. And I remember staying, I remember exactly which hotel we stayed at. We stayed at a hotel for six months. And my parents brought enough money for vacation and they were very, very, very wealthy. But all their money was sitting in Iran. So I'm, we're staying in America and uh, my parents are not really uh, 
practicing any type of religion whatsoever. So we end up growing up here in Los Angeles. And as I'm growing up, even though like Iran is a Muslim country, my parents are not practicing any type of religion. Uh, my father especially. So as I was growing up, I didn't know anything about Islam. I didn't know anything about um, even other religions. And what happens is there is this thing called secular. For those who may, may not understand what that word is, in Iran, there's two, mainly two groups of people, one who are very religious and one who are secular. Those who are secular means they kind of like separate religion with, their, uh, with being part of, like, part of their daily life. They just look at it like, oh, I just go to church or I just go to the mosque or I just go to that. And even then, my parents didn't really do that really much. So it wasn't really part of our grow upbringing. As I'm growing up in, in America, because I have no Islam, because I have nothing except for quote unquote Iranian culture, I was growing up for a very tough time. Now, I was living very wealthy as far as like, I grow up every, every morning, I wake up and my clothes are fixed for me. My, there's, some, there's someone who's housekeeping, taking care of everything. Even though we only came with vacation money, my parents had pretty very, very comfortable lifestyle. Our front door, I remember as a child, was never locked. We don't lock our front door. You can put your keys in your car with the windows down and nothing will ever happen. This is like every single day, just normal life for us. We don't worry about kidnapping. We don't worry about crime. We don't worry about anything. Nothing ever happens. That's how safe and like rich our area was. But all that money and all that thing didn't really make me happy. I used to drive a Mercedes Benz and I used to drive, I used to have like a, like a Rolex watch on my arm and used to have all this stuff, but I was never happy. Because money, as much as you even see this with celebrities now, as much as money gives you all those things, it doesn't bring you happiness. It doesn't give you peace. It makes you feel comfortable for a period of time, but it doesn't give you peace. And that's why you see a lot of people who are, as I said, rich and celebrities, they're just miserable. They're sad. They were, they were fighting for and striving and working so hard to get all of that. And then when they got it, it's like, huh, now what? Now what am I supposed to do? So as I'm growing up, I just start getting really, really, um, I was a kid that in school, I wasn't really popular, even though I was wealthy. Um, I didn't care about the wealth, so I don't really show it off, except for the car I drive and stuff like that. But it doesn't really, uh, I, found, I told myself, I, I wonder what the purpose of life is. You know, I see my, my family who has money and they're fighting. What's the purpose of life? I mean, when I ask questions about things, people didn't really have answers for me. I mean, is there a God? Is there? If there is, then why can't I see him or her? And if there's this religion says there's a hundred gods, like the Hindus or the Greeks. And you talk to the other people, so oh, there's a God, but he has a kid and his kid died. Like, really? What kind of God is that? <laughs> How can you not protect your own son? Okay, what about you? Oh, we believe there's a God. There's this little statue and we worship it. Okay, how much is the statue? $20. <laughs> what kind of God is that? <laughs> who, who makes your God? If your God came and make itself, what kind of God is that? Okay, forget that. So I'm growing up like everybody else. I have no path in life, right? So guess what I start doing? I start worshiping rock. Now you're thinking to yourself, what? Yeah, I start believing like the superstitious stuff that people believe. Like, you know, oh, like just like people say, oh, don't uh, have like a lucky rabbit's foot or a four leaf clover or whatever. These are all like superstitious mumbo jumbo. I used to have my own rocks because I'm like, okay, I need to find out something to worship because all of us have an instinct to worshiping something, right? You're thinking for something that you're looking to help you. Because no one told me about Islam, no one told me about anything, I just start worshiping these rocks. And when, guess what happened when my parents saw these rocks around my neck? They said, okay, that's fine. You can worship whatever you want to worship as long as you get good grades. So that was like when I was growing up. When I was seeing my family were secular, they had zero care what I practiced, religion, what kind of religion I practiced. So as I'm going, I, keep, I remember at night I would stay up and I was asking, oh, if there is a God out there, please, please lead me the right way. Please show me like the truth. And then one day, um, I have a friend who says, Ali, let's, uh, let's go to this camp and they're talking about Islam. Actually, let me rewind it. Let me tell you a little funny story what happened. So I'm looking at all these different religions and I'm like, okay, I gotta find something, I gotta find something. And then what happened was uh, uh, before I found anything, I remember I told you, I'm going through a dark time in my life. I'm like, I'm depressed. 
I'm not, I'm like the whole, what's the point of life, this and that. And I'm sitting inside the drive through of a fast food place. As I'm sitting through a drive through of a fast food place, guess what happens? This guy jumps into my car from the passenger seat. He opens the door, jumps in. I look to my right and the guy has tattoos all over his neck. He looks crazy like this. And I'm like, I don't say anything. He's like, go, go. I'm like, I start driving. And normally I'm like this. <laughs> the guy's uh, carjacking me, right? He's taking over this car. I don't know if he's gonna kill me or nothing. <laughs> but he's like, go, go, go. And I'm, as I'm driving, I think to myself, this guy got in the wrong car. So I'm like, calm. And he's normally, he's looking at me like, why is this guy so calm? And I realized to myself that for a guy who doesn't care about anything at this point, he got in the wrong car. And so I started doing this, I put the pedal to the metal and I started driving super fast. And I'm driving super fast. He's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? He started grabbing the part of the handlebar of the car who are you supposed to be? This is a true story, by the way. He's like, slow down, slow down. I'm like, no, no slowing down. He's like, ah! He starts screaming, say, pull over, pull over, pull over. I pull over the car, he jumps out of the car. I never see the guy again. I go home. I never tell the story to anybody. None of my friends, nobody. So uh, this happened shortly after my friend told me how late there's this thing we should go learn about Islam and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, Islam, let me go learn, figure out what that religion is because I don't know anything about that either. So I drive to a, uh, uh, the only mosque that we have in our area. And the mosque wasn't like a, really a mosque, it was like a house that converted to a mosque. So I walk inside, I have these long, I, my hair was long and crazy. My clothes was crazy. I walk in, hey guys. I don't know what Muslims are going to say to each other. Hi, guys. Hey, does anyone know about Islam? And, this, and they looked at me like, Brother, who is this guy? <laughs> what are you doing in the masjid? Why are you wearing these clothes? So they run towards me, all these guys dressed in white clothes, and they're in a circle, and they're old uncles, and like, uh, let me talk to him. They're like, no, let me talk to him. No, let me talk to him. And they, they're standing in line, like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, guys. Why are you guys all running towards me? And they're all trying to talk to me so they can make me Muslim. It's like, let me tell you, let me tell you about something very important, bro. And I'm like, what is it? Jinns. I was like, what? Jinns, let me tell you about the jinns. I'm like, jinns, what? I say, Jinns, you can't see them. And they can do this. I'm like, who is Jim? And then what happens was, this guy sounds so scary. I don't know what Jim and Jinns are. I'm like, of all the stuff you can talk to me about, what are you talking about Jinns for? So what happened? Uh, this guy like, stop scaring him. Move over, move over. Let me talk to him. Let me talk to him. I'm like, yeah, what is it? I got to talk to you about something. I said, what is it? I got to talk to you about Shaitan. <laughs> what? Shaitan, you can't see him. <laughs> I get in my car. I drive away. I start thinking to myself, which one was more scarier? The guy who like jumped in my car or, or, or these guys, Jim and Jim. I don't want nothing to do with Muslims. So what happened was these guys contact me. My, my friend contacts me and says, hey, we should go. I got a flyer to a camp. We should go learn about Islam. I'm like, no, no, no. They got Jim and, and Shaitan. I don't want to mess with those guys. No, no, I'll just go. We might be different. So I said, okay, fine. So I said, okay, but we're not, going alone. we're not going alone. So I got myself. I got my friend. I got a bunch of other friends. And everyone, we went all together. We went to this camp. And when we're at the camp, it's something special that's different because you're, all these normal distractions we have of the world was completely gone. Uh, and then we got a chance to really, really see the uh, Muslims and how they act and how they're different. And um, I saw things I didn't see before, ever when I was growing up. I saw how Muslims act. I saw how Muslims treat each other. I saw people from different colors of skin, different countries sit together and act like family. And they didn't care where you're from. Oh, I saw these things, different people from different countries, different races, and they acted like family. And I was like, what is making these people connect this way? I wanna learn about these people. So it wasn't like someone gave me a copy of the Quran. It wasn't someone, some, some, someone told me some amazing words. No, I wanna see with my own eyes. And when I saw things with my own eyes, I said, I want to be like these people. I want to be people. And what do you guys do? So we believe in Islam. What is Islam? Now I'm asking questions. We believe in one God. Really? How do you know it's one God? 
they started explaining. How do you know to do this? They started explaining. And at that night, I stayed up and they're asking more and more and more and more questions. By the next morning, I said, I want to be Muslim. I come back home, I tell my family. Now my family, who didn't care what type of religion I followed, guess what they say? Ah! Why, why are you guys all freaking out? My mom started screaming, my dad starts hitting his head against the wall. I'm like, what are you guys doing? Says, no, this religion is the Iran. For them, this is what they saw a different version of Islam. And what they did, didn't, what they thought they saw was Islam. What they really saw was Muslims in their home country being quote unquote Muslim, but they're not really practicing Islam. So they thought I was becoming one of those Muslims and I wasn't. So they took their self, brother, and he drove three hours away. And I didn't, I was all by myself in Los Angeles. And uh, it was hard. It was really hard. I had nothing. You know, my parents they said that you can you can choose to be Muslim if you want, or or practice this Islam that you're talking about, or you can come with us. You can live under the happy uh, comfort of this home, comfort of our money, comfort of this, this, and this, or you can choose to go on your own. I chose Islam, and for the first time in my life, a, a rich kid has to figure out how to do laundry. I never did laundry in my life. I only washed dishes, I think, once in my life as I was growing up. And that was out of a punishment because I did something bad. Otherwise, a kid that grows up, you don't know how to make your own food. You don't know how to do anything. And I didn't have any money of my own. It was a family's money. So I couldn't afford a nice place. So I moved into a very dangerous area. And I was by myself. I slept mostly on the floor at one point. Um, I just had, like, I remember one time I only had like bed sheets and like a pillow. That's my, for a year or two years, I slept on the floor, I remember at one point. Uh, originally I had a bed that made my head hurt, body hurt, but I had to like sleep on the floor. And that was my life. And you know what? I was actually happy. I didn't have access to all the money. I didn't have the fancy car. I didn't have all this stuff. All this stuff was gone. I had Islam. See what Islam gives you is this peace in your heart. That no matter how much stuff, material stuff you have, you can't fill it in. And when you have that, you are content. There's a lot of people who are not content. Content means like being happy with what Allah has given you. And I was happy. And this was a test. Allah took everything away, including my friends. A lot of my friends didn't want to be, almost all my friends, not all, all of my friends didn't want anything to do with me because now you're not fun anymore. You want to do all the haram stuff and bad stuff we used to do before Islam. Now you have rules that you follow except for the few that became Muslim the same time I did. And those people who came to the camp as I did. And they're friends till today with me. So they saw what I saw. They saw the beauty of Islam because we found a few Muslims who are happy to practice Islam in the correct way. Unfortunately, you don't see Muslims practicing Islam in the correct way today. Today, you come in, even if you're a convert, you see Muslims and you think, wow, Islam says this and Muslims say this. Like, why, why is there such a big difference? And a lot of people will say what I say. Alhamdulillah, Allah showed me Islam before he showed me the Muslims. It's a really sad thing to say if you think about it. Because you think Muslims should be the ambassadors, the, the people who are representing Islam. But they're not. And that's why it's up to us to learn in the colors of Islam club the true Islam. So we can be those ambassadors. We can be those representatives for Islam. So when people see you and your actions, just like I saw the actions of those people at that camp, they want to be Muslim. It doesn't take a fancy words that you have to say or you have to give them a copy of something. No, just by seeing your actions, they say, wow, I want to be like you. What do you believe in? What do you learn? What it makes you, because something about you makes you act the way you do, the way you deal in business, the way you do in actions and stuff like that. So that is my short version of my, you know, it sounds like a short version, but there's actually a lot of stuff going on, but maybe I can extend more answers for you guys. But I just answered question number two. And as I said, some episodes take almost, uh, some questions take almost an entire episode. We're like 22 minutes. And Baba Ali's talking about just his part of the summit. He didn't even tell us all the details. So maybe in a future episode, I can share more details for you. Uh, I can give you one more piece before we bring Hanifa in. Um, one thing is that my parents, for three years, they want nothing to really do with Islam or Muslims or this and that because of what they saw 
the opposite of what I saw, Muslims who didn't act very Muslim. And uh, so they thought I was becoming one of those people. And what happened was when I became rich, when I became poor, when I had a fancy job, when I didn't have anything, whatever my situation was in life, my, my mother watched how I acted. She saw what I did. She saw how I treated her. This is very, very important. How you interact with her, how you treat her, how you treat your family. She saw those things and she said, after three years, she said, whatever this religion of yours is, I now accept it. Not me becoming your religion, but I now accept it. I accept you as my son and I'm happy that you became this. What helped also happened just not that, just a few years ago, she just, she told me and my wife that she's Muslim. That was a game changer. Again, the only interaction she really has with Muslims is with me. So I was patient with her. I was kind with her. I wasn't like trying to, well, you have to do this, you have to do this. No, it's just being you and being kind and being like the way Islam has taught us to do with kind friendship and listening to your parents, it would change everything for them, inshallah. So um, I know you guys, some of you have been ask, asking me questions and I apologize for not answering. Normally I'm answering them in chat, but I've been looking at you guys the whole time and I haven't been reading the chat. So as soon as I'm done and Auntie Hippo's in the section, I will try to read them and maybe um, answer them next week. I don't want to answer during Auntie Hippo's section, uh, but I will do want to do some type of arts and crafts today because we don't be all like deep conversation. So I know you guys know there's my daughter, there's one called Amina. Do you guys remember the other name of the other girl? If you guys can help me remember, I have a daughter. It's kind of embarrassing when you don't remember her. <laughs> Does anyone remember her name? Hanifa, yes! No remembers. Yes, Amina. Yes, yes, yes. They remember, they remember. Oh, Hanifa, can you bring some arts and crafts for today? Oh, that's who it is. It's her. Arts and crafts provided. Uh, yes. Okay, Hanifa, what do you have for us for today? Today we'll be making these corner bookmarks that you can draw on. If you go into almost any page of any book inside our house, almost any page, you can see a very faint line. That's because me and my sister, we fold the corner of the book to hold our spot. Whenever we go take a break or go to sleep or do anything like that. And I'm trying to get rid of those lines, but they do not go away. It looks like that. They're there. <laughs> You have a book, a bunch of letters like this? That's almost any book inside this house. <laughs> okay. So these book covers, you can just open up any page whenever you're stopping. Uh -huh. And then you can just put this one in. Oh, cool, cool, cool. close the book so you can remember. How cool is that? And then you open it up. Oh, dude, this is so cool. Much better than a boring thing that just turns out like this. And they all look like this. <laughs> Okay, so tell us how to make one. Okay, so all you need is just some paper and maybe scissors. You can try doing his um, wet, like you can wet the corner of the paper and try ripping it tactic, or you can just use scissors. This time I remember, so we don't have to do that again. <laughs> Once you get your paper, you just need to make it into a square, which is what you do with most origami paper. You're gonna fold it like so, wow. just a little bit, and then you wanna try making it as straight as possible. It's okay if it's not perfect. I don't think it's ever worked out for me this well. So <laughs> just have to straighten it out. And then you're going to get this part. Actually, I'll just make one more time. You see this little extra rectangle? You want to then chop it all off. It's hard to go this way, but I'm going to try. Oh, it's so close. And then. Right. Okay. So once you get this part, a good square. You're gonna cut it, you're gonna fold it like this so you have this main triangle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So exciting. <laughs> then you're gonna fold the top, like the big pointy part down, okay. right in the middle. I'm trying to make it straight. It's okay if it doesn't work out. It just needs to be straight enough. Okay. And then you see how you have, if you look closely, you have three triangles one right here, another one, two to the side. So you're just gonna get this other one. You know what's better than two triangles? Three. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Five triangles. You're gonna fold it down. It's uh -huh. hard to do it this way, but we're gonna try. And then we're gonna go this part. It almost looks like a letter. Mm -hmm. It looks like a good envelope. Like an envelope. Yeah. Is that right? Yep, you did it. Thank you. Okay, so then you're gonna open up the top part. Actually, no, you're gonna open up one layer. 
So you see how you have two pieces? You're going to open up just one piece. Okay. Then you're going to get this, this, one, this one triangle, and you're going to fold it up so these two corners, they match. Wow. And you're going to do that with the opposite side as well. Where do you come up with this stuff? <laughs> After seeing all the creases in almost any book inside this house, like a solution must be made. Wow, 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 wow. I want to do it. I want to do it. I, you ever watch the video? Like, let me do it. That's me. Okay. So now we're almost done. You're going to get this part. This part's a little tricky. You're going to get this part. And inside, you made a little pouch. So you're going to get this part and just going to fold it in. Like a kangaroo's pouch? Yep, just like a kangaroo. And then you're done. You can draw anything you want on the front. This is just the, so the corner slot so the paper can go inside the book. It fits with almost any book inside your house. If it's a little smaller, then maybe you can try making a smaller square and doing the exact same thing. And you can draw anything. You can make a smiley face. So cool! And look, you got outside of your book cover. Mm -hmm. It matches. Yeah, your, your dress and your pants match the book. <laughs> they do. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I, I did, because I won a prize. Okay, you got a high five then. I told you. Okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you, Anifa. Thank you. See, Hanifa always comes with this creative stuff. She's like the most creative, one of the most creative people in this whole house. And she's one of my two favorite daughters in the whole wide world. Well, Bali, how many daughters do you have? Two! Ha! Well, that doesn't count. Anyways, today we shared our um, story about how I convert to Islam. I hopefully answer some of your questions. Is my family Muslim? My brother is now Muslim. My mom is now Muslim. My dad has passed away. And, uh, and that's all I have. I only have one sibling. And, uh, and then what I told myself when I became Muslim is I'm going to try to teach my kids all the things about Islam I never grew, grew up learning about. And that's how I've been trying to raise Amin and Hanifa. So I hope that I answered your guys' questions today. As, you guys, as I promised, I try to answer your guys' questions every week. And no matter what type of question you ask, I try to answer it. As long as it's not like two fifty questions like, hey, is this haram or halal? I don't know. I'm an expert or some things. If I don't know, I say I don't know. But I want to say thank you, everybody. If you have any more questions, the link is at the very top. I may post it for you guys one more time. Uh, and if you have questions, make sure to post them. So with that said, I just want to say something, everybody. Thank you very much for being so patient with me today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Did you guys enjoy it? If you guys can tell me quickly, did you guys enjoy Baba Ali telling you guys his story? If you did, just say yes or no. Maybe so. You did enjoy it. Okay. It's a little bit different. And uh, hopefully, inshallah, we'll do some more Ask Baba Ali tomorrow. With that... I would like to say salam alaikum, buddy, and I would like to introduce uh, someone very special. Someone who's part of the Cubs Islam Club. That is Auntie Hiba. Auntie Hiba, hello. Can you help hello. us? Hello. Hey, yeah. here she is. Salam alaikum. Here I am. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much, Baba Ali. Oh my gosh, I was mesmerized by that story. Were you guys mesmerized? Do you know what mesmerized means? Yes. I, the camera is kind of blurry. Yeah, that's true. Why is that? That's strange. That's strange. I just noticed that, that myself. Is that better? Oh, no. Seems like we're also having internet problems. Do you know Auntie Zahra was also having internet problems? And it seems like all the way over here in Pakistan, we are also having internet problems. And we are doing that because it is extremely, extremely, extremely hot. I'm trying to rub it with my finger. I don't know if it'll clean up, but sorry, guys. I didn't realize that I used it earlier in a call as well. What's happening over here is that it is beyond hot. Like it is so hot that you wouldn't believe. And so because of that, we are having a lot of fluctuations in terms of electricity. You know, Pakistan is a little bit of a poor country, right? We don't have a lot of money here. And so when a lot of people start using their air conditioners or their fans or whatever, then yeah, the whole country has less electricity to go around. So we get a lot of fluctuations and the electricity goes a lot and stuff. But anyways, I am happy to be here. I am so sorry that my camera is blurry, but my mind is crystal clear after listening to Baba Ali's amazing story. I love hearing people's stories because it shows all the ways that we are different. And if you guys remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how your identity and your story, owning your story is so important because we want to know how all of us are different, right? And why is that? Remember, I ask you a lot of questions, so I always like seeing your typing fingers. 
So take out your typing fingers and tell me why is being different important? Like knowing that we're different. Why should we know we're different? Yeah, 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 you're unique, definitely. We're unique. All of us are in, in a way unique as well. And so today I want to talk to you about knowing the things that make us special, the things that Allah has blessed us with, and using them in a way. Yeah, Samiha and Sabiha, everyone was the same, would be boring. That's definitely true. And so when I was listening to Baba Ali, I came to a conclusion that there's an ayah in the Quran that just, it comes to mind all the time. Do you know an ayah? Let me ask you guys. There is an ayah in the Quran. It is the most repeated ayah in the whole Quran. It comes a lot of times. Can anyone think of an ayah that comes many, many times? in the Quran. Good memory, no, amazing. You think you have a very good memory. That makes memorization easy for you. Hanan and Amira say, I'm blessed to eat, which means you guys have more food. So you never have to worry about, oh my gosh, is there enough food in our fridge? Is there enough food in our fridge? Air conditioner, yeah. So you're not like, you know what? I can't do anything. I can't work. I can't study because we are too hot. We're in, under the blazing sun, right? You have a good home, Shamila. very good. Caring parents, yeah. You're never afraid that, you know what, I might come home today and my parents might hurt me or something. No, you have caring parents, right? So that helps you feel secure and comfortable. So all of the blessings in our life is something, yeah, Heather is saying that our dad is still able to provide for us. We have access to medicine, electricity. Excellent, you guys are all talking about something called privileges. Has anyone heard that word? Do you guys know what a privilege is? What is a privilege? A privilege, let's listen carefully and try to understand this. A privilege is a special benefit or favor or blessing that we have in our life and that, you know, that some people have and some people might not have. And it's different. And the people who have it didn't do anything to really earn it. So today I want to talk to you, actually today and tomorrow, I want to talk to you a little bit about recognizing our privilege, about understanding what it is, and seeing how it sets us up for doing good deeds. And isn't that like the best part about being a Muslim, like doing good deeds, being of service in society? So I'm really trying to do that. And I think this whole pandemic coronavirus type thing is a really good reminder that, you know, we're on this earth to do good and be good, right? So I'm going to put on a little video that I want you guys to watch about privilege, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it some more. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Today's video is brought to you by the letter P. P is for penguins. P is for pizza. P is for penguins with pizza. And P is for privilege. Have you heard that word? Privilege. 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 What is privilege? A privilege is a special benefit or advantage available to some people and not others. It's one way that we are different from each other. Hmm. Special advantage. Sounds nice to have, right? So that must mean that privilege is also good to have, right? Well, good thing available to some people and not other people isn't exactly right. The thing is, privileges are special advantages which we haven't necessarily earned through our hard work, but are simply lucky to have through Allah's blessing. For example, I am so blessed that I was born with two strong legs. Alhamdulillah. My legs make sure I am able to get around easily and I can go pretty much wherever I want to go. I don't worry that is there any restaurant or shop that I might not be able to enter. But that is not true for my friend Fatih. Her legs don't work the same way as mine and she has to go around in a wheelchair. The cinema near her house, you know, if she wants to watch a movie, it has so many stairs and a narrow door. Her wheelchair can't go in. So she often misses movies that she really might have wanted to see. And that happens a lot sometimes, you know, because she often doesn't go to places because people haven't really thought about putting ramps up on those entrances, uh, on the entrances. So my able body gives me the privilege of doing many things 
that she cannot. Another way I have privilege is that I can speak both English and Urdu, and I can read and write in both languages. I went to school, and my parents also went to school. I also never have to worry, will there be enough food in my house for my family to eat? Again, alhamdulillah. But what about those kids or those families who can't go to school? If they don't get to go to school, they don't learn how to read and write. If they don't learn how to read and write, it's harder for them to get and do jobs that they would like. And it makes it harder for them to access information which could teach them new things. Sort of like what you're doing with this video. For example, think about Ahmed. Ahmed's dad is a gardener. He does important things like keeping our parks and gardens beautiful and healthy. Now, Ahmed works with his dad to help him earn money for the family so that they can keep their home and have enough food to eat. Ahmed dreams of being a teacher. He would love to be a teacher. But because he works so hard, he has to worry about whether we eat enough food or not. He doesn't have the privilege of time or a relaxed mind to learn reading or you know, study or watch videos that could teach him new things. We can also have privilege because of where we were born, what kind of jobs our parents have, even the way we look. Sometimes there's privilege for being a boy instead of a girl or of belonging to a religion that most of the people in the country have. Now, the tricky thing about privilege is that it only means that some types of people get to enjoy things that everyone should get to enjoy. It means the world can be sometimes unfair to see, you know, to people simply because of who they are. Does that mean privilege is bad? Should I feel bad about my privileges? The blessings that Allah has given me? Can privilege actually be a good thing? For that, let us first turn to Allah and see what He has said about blessings and privilege, about all the special favors in our lives. When I think about favors, I think of a very awesome ayah. It is the ayah that has been repeated the most in the Quran. You know what that ayah is? Yes, from Surah Rahman. Then which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? This verse often reminds me that I do have a lot of favors that Allah has blessed me with. And it's important to recognize them and reflect over them. Also, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, when the message of Islam was just beginning, we saw many people use their privilege to help the Prophet wasallam, and the Muslims. For example, in a previous video, I mentioned Sayyidina Bilal and how when he was a slave, his cruel master used to torture him and beat him up. It was Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, who realized his privilege of wealth and good standing in the Quraysh that made him go to that evil master and say, I will buy Bilal and set him free. Another great example of recognizing and using privilege is how the Prophet Sallallahu uncles protected him even when they weren't Muslims. So people like Abu Talib in the early days, Hamza radiallahu anh, used their privilege of being powerful clan leader to stop other people from bothering the Prophet Sallallahu To understand our privilege as best as we can, we need a little something called self-awareness. Is self awareness. Self awareness means knowing who we are, why we make the decisions we make, and knowing when we are right or wrong. It sort of means looking at ourselves and our thoughts and our behaviors as if we're looking at ourselves from a distance. Like if I'm practicing self awareness right now, I'll be like, hmm, I can see Hiba making this video. She seems a little nervous and excited but I think she wants to do a good job because this is important. Hmm. That's called self-awareness. It is good to be self-aware of our identity because it helps us to know what privileges we have and don't have, right? right. That helps us show empathy to others who are different from us. What is 
empathy. It means being able to feel the way someone else is feeling, to understand someone else's situation, to walk in someone else's shoes, and to feel for them in your heart. Empathy means you care about other human beings too, and not just yourself. And it makes you understand that everyone's lives are different. It makes you a good human, a good friend, and a good Muslim. Do you know my favorite thing about empathy? It can lead to action. Action is when we take our self-awareness, which tells us who we are and how we're privileged, and our empathy, which teaches us to notice other people's feelings and bring them together to do good. For example, do you remember my friend Fatma who needs a wheelchair to get around? Well, my self-awareness told me that having strong, healthy legs is a privilege. My empathy made me feel sad and angry that my friend can't always enjoy going to the same places that I can just because of her leg situation. So we talked about what we could do to kind of you know, make the situation a little better. We decided to write letters to places like the mall and the cinema and her favorite restaurant. We asked them, please remember to put wraps so that people in wheelchairs can also enjoy what you are offering. So we translated being a good person into doing a good thing. And that's the thing about privilege. Look, there are some things in this world that we can't change, but there's lots that we can change if people with privileges start to think critically about the special advantages they have over other people and how they can use those advantages to help people like you and me. Remember, we are not all exactly the same, and that's okay. That's sometimes good, but sometimes we need to work towards making that difference a little smaller. Our skin colors are different, our money situation is different, our health and physical ability is different, our family situation is different. Lots of things are different. So why not start to look closely at those differences so that we can work towards making a difference? Remember, when we are aware of our privilege, we can translate our empathy into action. And that will help create equality. So, here are your three things to do. Three fingers up. Number one, think about the different privileges or blessings that you have in your life. Number two, thank Allah for giving them to you by naming them and saying Alhamdulillah. And number three, talk to a grown-up for ideas on how you can use your privilege to do one small thing that will make this world a tiny bit better for everyone. Because that's the most important thing, right? Right. That's it for now. Remember, be good, do good, and who loves you? Allah loves you. Bye-bye. So we learned a bunch of different terms in there. We learned about self-awareness, which we talked about, recognizing, you know, what we do, why we do it, kind of being able to see our thoughts, like from a distance. Are you guys ever able to do that? Does anyone ever feel like they're practicing self-awareness that, yeah, I know I'm being a little bit silly right now. Can you ever see yourself behaving a little silly or something like that? That's called self-awareness. And we talked about empathy. Now, who can remember what is exactly empathy? Because that's what we're going to discuss more in detail tomorrow. So I want to make sure that we have a little bit of an idea where we're headed tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. the fact that autism awareness, the fact that you know that, that is definitely self-awareness. That's amazing. I think having, having that awareness about yourself and advocating for that is just incredible. Yeah. No, enough fun. You're on the right track. Empathy is to feel for someone. And privilege is what? So what did we learn about privilege then? right? Empathy is putting yourself in other people's shoes. And what about privilege? Privilege was kind of recognizing something that you have. But does that mean privilege kind of means that you have an easy life? Is that what, what it means? What do you guys think? Does privilege actually mean you have an easier life than other people? You have something? Well, it's not exactly that. I see that some of you are saying maybe that is, and I've got a lot of people privately messaging me, but I do want to make that clear, guys, that just because you have a privilege doesn't mean
that your life is easy, right? You, you're, you might be easier in one situation, but it could still mean that your life is hard in other situations. And I think that's important to see. There are many things that make our privileges intersect with each other, right? In some ways, we are lucky because of the way we look or the way we, the way, for example, the way we speak English, right? All of us can speak English. That puts us in a bit of a privileged situation. But there's many things in life that we are not uh, privileged about. And so balancing all of that and deciding how we will use our privileges is the important part. So we were talking about exercising empathy, right? And talking about what privileges we have and what empathy we can show to others. So currently in this pandemic situation, what privileges do you think you guys have right now? Alhamdulillah, none of us have gotten sick so far. Does anyone know anyone personally who's gotten the coronavirus? Yeah, you guys do. Oh, I mean, that's not true. We don't have less cases than the U.S. Actually, do you know Pakistan has the most cases in the world? Yeah, we are number one in a very bad and sad situation. I love what Heather wrote here. Heather says we have access to almost everything as long as we have money, okay? We have access to healthcare and medicine. We speak English and live in an affluent area. Yeah, all the places that you guys are mentioning, like Italy and the US, they've had more deaths so far. But the situation in Pakistan is bad because we've only got a few hospitals, right? We don't have hospitals like all over the place like US does. We have maybe like in Karachi, in the city that I am, we have maybe like four hospitals. And each of those hospitals has now closed their doors and they've put these big signs up outside their doors that we are not letting anyone else in now. That's how bad our, our healthcare situation is. So, you know, things are, things are tricky for everyone. So I wanted to just uh, share the screen one more time with you so we can read a little about empathy and uh, then we will, hopefully you guys can hear me. Okay. Let me bring this bigger. So if you look at what is written about empathy, let's just go through it together so that all of us understand this word. What is empathy? Have you ever heard the saying, try to put yourself in someone else's shoes? This means that you should try to understand their point of view. Looking at things from another person's viewpoint helps you develop empathy. Empathy means thinking about what other people are thinking and feeling. When you express empathy, you have compassion for others. You show concern for their feelings. Empathy helps you understand others' feelings under different circumstances. We all have the ability to express empathy towards others. Empathy is a skill that you can develop. You can show and develop empathy by taking time to listen to others express their feelings and by being respectful of what they say. As you build your empathy, you become more aware of the people around you. Show your empathy by listening to what others have to say. So when, oh man, racism, right. I know you guys are think, thinking about that. Seriously, when will racism end? We don't know but we can at least show empathy for the people who are really, really struggling with this, this fight, right? In America, the Black Lives Matter movement is picking up steam, you know, they're tearing down slavery time statues, and they're trying to make their point that enough is enough, right? So we might not, all of us might not understand what's going on and why everything is happening the way, but empathy allows us to see that, you know what? People have been really mistreated for a very long time and they have a right to be angry, right? So that is what we're thinking. So can you guys tell me, sometimes I like what Noor wrote. Sometimes you have empathy, but for some reason you cannot help the person. Like a person lost his father, but you can't get it back for him. That's true. You know, I lost my parents a couple of years ago and I realized that everyone around me who had parents didn't really understand, but they were trying, right? They were trying to show empathy about my situation, but it takes time. It takes time to understand, but our practice 
it's sort of, it's not like you're born with empathy, right? It's something you practice. And so that's what we want to practice. So today I just wanted to revise the ayah that we learned in Surah Rahman, which was that very special ayah that is recited the most, right? There is no other ayah that has come in the Quran so many times. And does anyone know how many times? Is there any super genius person over here that, that knows how many times has Fabi come inside the Quran? Throw out a number. Whoever is the closest will get a round of applause. It comes 31 times. It is 31 times in the Quran. Yeah, in Surah Rahman. So it's a nice, important ayah to, to learn. Thank you, Yahya. Yeah. We don't realize the blessings unless they are taken away. I think that's an important part of being a Muslim is to constantly be aware of our blessings. Let's make that part of our self-awareness. So tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit more about empathy and we are going to make some strategies. So do have a pencil and paper with you. So maybe we'll do some note taking or write some words at the same time. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing Baba Ali's story. I thought that was very, very powerful. And, you know, like his story, his life story is so different from mine, but I was able to show empathy and sort of understand his situation, or at least I tried. So that's it for today from all of us at Cover uh, Colors of Islam Club. And inshallah, we'll all see you again tomorrow without any technical difficulties. Today was like, mics are coming, mics are going, lots of crazy things happening, but such is life. All right, so you guys take care of yourselves and inshallah, I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Assalamu alaikum everyone, bye-bye, wave, wave, wave.